to formally open the scientific meeting, may we all welcome the Vice President of the PPA and Chair of the Subcommittee on Continuing Education in Psychiatry, Dr. Antonio Sison. Good evening, PPA. I'm Dr. Antonio Tofi Sison, and I wish to welcome you to the 7th PPA 2021 Scientific Meeting. I do hope you listen and participate in tonight's program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sison, for the warm welcome. Moving right along, it is my pleasure to introduce the chair of the, of the UERM, Department of Psychiatry, Dr. Norieta Calma Balderrama for the opening address. Thank you, MC. A pleasant good evening. I am pleased to see all of you virtually behind your cameras, acknowledging our PPA officers headed by our dear president, Dr. Luz Katigbak, and our Vice President, Dr. Tofi Sison, colleagues, friends, conjugate staff, and guests. The UERM MMC Department of Psychiatry joins the Philippine Psychiatric Association in recognizing and celebrating the heroic efforts of all residents, our modern day heroes, who silently but surely treats patients with care at the risk of their health and the health of their families. They have experienced a lot of difficult times. They've been in quarantine. Uh, they've been infected with COVID. They had sleepless nights, donning the difficult PPE, caring for their families. And on top of that, they have to study for their grand rounds. And also they have to be up to date to the new findings regarding illnesses during the pandemic. So today, it is but fitting to devote our scientific uh, session to discuss the concerns of residents, especially their mental health. We salute all residents in our country as we discuss the topic, mental health of residents in training in other specialties. We would like to thank Dr. Liz Mariano, an expert and a great speaker for choosing and agreeing to talk about this topic. Likewise, to our very efficient and hardworking resident reactor, Dr. Audrey Marie Chua from the Department of Neurology, and Dr. Cheng for introducing Dr. Lee's. Dr. Elham Bocalbos, our training officer, my heartfelt gratitude for helping PPA organize this event and all consultants from our department who have cared with compassion for our own psychiatry residents. A big thank you to all of you there, consultants, mentors. And um, uh, uh, I'd like to uh, take note that you have made a difference in the lives of residents in your hospital and you have made it more meaningful and less difficult for them. So I hope that today's scientific session will not only be informative, but will open our eyes to the importance of caring for the mental health of residents and so let us all relax as we listen to our speakers. Thank you for attending tonight's scientific session and stay safe, everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Balderrama. That was really heartfelt. So to those who just logged in, welcome again to the seventh scientific meeting. Dr. Sison and Dr. Balderrama have already given their welcome and opening remarks respectively. Now to introduce our speaker and reactor for tonight, I would like to give the floor to one of our dear consultants at the UERM Department of Psychiatry, Dr. Cherry Rich Cheng. Um, um, good evening, everyone. It is an honor to introduce our speaker and reactor for tonight's scientific meeting. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic and its restrictions have strained personal psychological resilience of everyone, including healthcare workers. Attention is now being drawn to adverse effects of the pandemic on individual and societal mental health. It is thus suitable for us to talk about the mental health of our residents 
who from the beginning of the pandemic up until now have shown resilience in the ever-changing conditions in the training institutions. To talk to us about the matter of mental health of residents in training in other specialties is Dr. Melissa Paulita V. Mariano. And to share with us her insights and experiences of what the current batch of residents are going through right now is Dr. Odrin Marie Yu Chua. Dr. Melissa Paulita V. Mariano is a graduate of the University of Santo Tomas Faculty of Medicine and Surgery with distinction of magna cum laude benemeritus. She is presently an assistant professor of psychiatry at the University of the East Ramon Magsaysay Memorial Medical Center. She had her residency training in psychiatry and also finished her fellowship in clinical research at the Research Institute of Health Science at the, at the same institution. She recently completed her master's in science in molecular medicine thesis track at the St. Luke's College of Medicine, William H. Quasha Memorial. Through the years, our highly esteemed speaker has been a member and has held major positions in different associations. From 2016 to 2019, she was the manuscript editor of the Philippine Journal of Psychiatry. She is currently the vice president of the Philippine College of Psychopharmacology. Dr. Mariano has been the recipient of several local and international awards, such as the Young Psychiatrist Fellowship Award, World Congress of Asian Psychiatry, and the Dean Hoven Kwanang Best Teacher Award in the Clinical Division, UERMMC. And she also had Fellowship Award of the Japanese Society of Psychiatry and Neurology. She ranked number one in the Philippine Physician Licensure Examinations. She has also published and contributed and presented several research papers in the field of psychiatry. She has also been a speaker at different conferences and postgraduate courses in psychiatry, both locally and internationally. Our reactor, Dr. Audrey, Audrey Marie Uchua, graduated with a degree in BS Pharmacy from the University of San Agustin in 2012 and then passed her pharmacy licensure examination the following year. She then finished her medical degree from the University of the East Ramon Magsaysay Memorial Medical Center in 2017, after which she had her postgraduate internship at Cardinal Santos Medical Center. After passing the physician board examination in 2018, Dr. Chua started her residency training in neurology at the University of the East Ramon Magsaysay Memorial Medical Center and Cardinal Santos Medical Center Consortium Program. She is currently a second year resident in the aforementioned program. Colleagues, please welcome Dr. Mariano and Dr. Chua. Gosh, Hello and good evening. I hope I can be heard clearly. Thank you so much to the Philippine Psychiatric Association for giving me the opportunity to speak for the seventh scientific meeting, which is hosted by our institution, the UERM Department of Psychiatry. I'd also like to thank, before starting the lecture, Dr. Cheng for the kind introduction, Dr. Balderama, who spoke touchingly about the current difficulties of our residents in training, including psychiatry residents, but also residents in other specialties, and to our residents who have facilitated also everything technical about this meeting tonight. I have titled the lecture or the session tonight, um, Caring for a Residence, Compassion, Fatigue, and Adaptive Leadership During the COVID-19 Pandemic. And there are but three lecture objectives for the evening. 
The first will be uh, remembering redefining compassion fatigue in the context of health workers during the COVID-19 pandemic together with a presentation of local findings regarding compassion fatigue among residents in training in other specialties, as well as other international papers about this. And finally, to recognize the importance of collaborative institutional efforts to help address compassion fatigue and mental health concerns among our dear residents in training. We have had Zoom meetings since last year because of the COVID-19 pandemic, and it seems that it is not stopping anytime soon. The proof, of course, will be the meeting for tonight, but the ongoing measures to curb the spread of the Delta variant in our country. The COVID pandemic had actually started way back in 2019, as we all know, in the city of Wuhan in Hubei province, China. And as early as January 2020, the World Health Organization had declared it a public health emergency of international concern with the pandemic status being declared March 11, 2020. As of yesterday, there were 196 million cases worldwide with 4 million deaths. And in our country, we've had 1.57 million cases, 1.48 million recoveries, and more than 27,000 deaths because of the pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic has created multiple challenges for our mental resilience. It has imposed irreversible psychological impact on human society. And psychological reactions to pandemics will include maladaptive coping mechanisms, emotional distress, and defensive responses, such that the WHO cautions us not to overlook psychological needs during any phase in pandemic management. When we focus on the special population of our healthcare workers, we must understand that healthcare workers are at significant risk for the development of adverse health outcomes during this pandemic. What are the reasons for their increased risk? These include longer working hours, the uncertain nature of the pandemic, and the corresponding risk of infection. At times, there are shortages of protective equipment. There can be loneliness, because of their distancing of themselves from their family members, physical fatigue, and again, separation from families. Now, it is unfortunate that psychiatric problems in healthcare workers tend to be under-recognized because of stigma and also decreased health-seeking behaviors. And this is something that we will tackle later on in the lecture. I'd like to share with you an original investigation published in the Lancet Journal of Psychiatry, which is actually one of the earliest articles published regarding the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the mental health outcomes among healthcare workers. This was a cross-sectional survey conducted from January to February 2020 in China. So it was, again, one of the earliest that we have had when it comes to literature on healthcare workers. And the objective was to assess mental health outcomes among healthcare workers treating COVID-19 patients. In this study, they used the PHQ-9, the JD-7, the Insomnia Severity Index, and the Impact of Event Scale revised to assess mental health outcomes. The participants were healthcare workers from 34 hospitals, including 702 physicians and 1,128 nursing staff. Of these, 522 were working in the front lines or were directly seeing patients with COVID. Now, most of the participants in this study were women aged 26 to 40 years, married, widowed, or divorced, and worked in tertiary hospitals. Nearly all lived in urban areas. In a snapshot, these were the results of the study. 34% of patients 
sorry, 34% of healthcare workers endorsed significant symptoms of insomnia, 44% that of anxiety, 50% of depression, and 71.5% endorsed moderate to severe levels of distress as measured by the IESR. Now, nurses, women, frontline workers, and those in the epicenter of the pandemic then reported experiencing more severe symptom levels of depression, anxiety, insomnia, and distress. Participants who were in less equipped hospitals, so secondary hospitals, were also more likely to report severe symptoms of depression, anxiety, and insomnia. Now, working in the front line was an independent risk factor for all the psychiatric symptoms. So working in the front line actually led to increased risk for all of these measures. Now, let me transition to a psychological phenomenon that is known as compassion fatigue or the cost of caring. The current hospital landscape of the pandemic increases the risk for compassion, fatigue, and perceived stress for healthcare workers. According to Dr. Figley, compassion fatigue is a state experienced by those helping people in distress. It is an extreme state of tension and preoccupation with the suffering of those being helped to the degree that it can cause secondary traumatic stress for the helper. Now, in the past, compassion fatigue has been seen in hospitals among those, for example, who treat patients with cancer. So the nurses and the physicians working with patients with severe pain, severe suffering. Firefighters are at risk for compassion fatigue, and so are those in other helping professions, including psychiatry. Now, Professor Cullen also states that we should anticipate a considerable increase in anxiety and depressive symptoms among people who do not have pre-existing mental health conditions, with some experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder in due course. So the pandemic actually creates a, this sort of environment, this current hospital landscape that will make and increase make for an increased risk of developing symptoms even among our healthcare workers who previously have not demonstrated any mental health symptoms how exactly can we measure compassion fatigue compassion fatigue can be a part of what is known as professional quality of life as you can see in the left Professional quality of life can be divided into compassion satisfaction, which is the pleasure derived from being able to work well and be of service to others. This is our goal as physicians. But at the bottom, we also see its converse, which is compassion fatigue. Compassion fatigue can be divided into burnout and secondary traumatic stress. Burnout will include feelings of hopelessness and difficulties in dealing with work but secondary traumatic stress will pertain to trauma as a result of being exposed to suffering or being exposed to people who have severe stress. In line with this, a study was conducted on the prevalence of compassion fatigue among Filipino physicians and nurses during the early phase of the pandemic in our country. So this was a cross-sectional survey that was conducted from April to May, and the objective really was to measure the prevalence of compassion fatigue in our healthcare workers. The measures used included the professional quality of life scale and the perceived stress scale. Among the participants were 260 physicians and 49 nurses. 77% of the participants were frontliners and 43% had been quarantined as a result of exposure. And most of the physicians, similar to the Chinese study, were female and aged 31 to 40 years old working in an urban environment. The specialties which were covered were 24% belonged to internal medicine, 
23% in pediatrics and 7% in radiology as well as family medicine. The other specialties numbered less than 7% of the demographics. According to the ProQOL5, the results were that more than half of the healthcare workers studied had moderate burnout and 65% had secondary traumatic stress. Who were at risk for developing compassion fatigue, meaning burnout and secondary traumatic stress? In the study, the risk factors included being female, being single, being younger, meaning less than 40 years, working in a private setting, working in Luzon outside of NCR, practicing in general practice and emergency medicine, direct contact with COVID cases, and the experience of quarantine. It was interesting to note that in this study, nurses compared to physicians tended to have increased levels of perceived stress but scored the same as physicians across measures of compassion fatigue. Now, according to pre previous literature, other risk factors for compassion fatigue include other directedness, service in the context of trauma, the lack of coping mechanisms, the lack of personal boundaries, and past traumatic experiences. It has been said that people with too much empathy are at highest risk for compassion fatigue. What of residents in training specifically? This study does not focus anymore on compassion fatigue, but it focuses on a special population of healthcare workers, which are our residents. So this study, which was recently published this 2021, is entitled The Impact of COVID-19 Pandemic on Training and Mental Health of Residents. It was also a survey which was conducted late 2020, this time in Jordan, and the objective was to investigate the impact of the pandemic on residents and residency training programs. So they developed a questionnaire with training details, the impact of the pandemic disease contraction, meaning what if the resident actually had COVID? How would they feel and what were their mental health outcomes like? And the indirect impact, meaning the mental health effects of the pandemic in general. 255 residents among 19 residency training programs were invited to participate in the study, which used a convenience sampling technique and an online survey method. Now, based on the specialties of the residents, the investigators actually divided them into two groups, the surgical residents group and the non-surgical residents group. So in the non-surgical residents group, of course, will include um, residents in psychiatry, internal medicine, emergency medicine. Surgical residents will include those in surgery, obstetrics and gynecology, ophthalmology, and ENT. The mean age of the participants were 27 years and 48.2% were male, so more were female. And we will see that more survey participants actually belong to the younger or the lower years of training, the first and the second year residents. Now, they sought to measure, the investigators sought to measure the impact of the pandemic on residents in training when it comes to mental health outcomes, but also when it comes to clinical settings and teaching programs. This table will present the effect of the pandemic on first the clinical settings and teaching programs. We can see here that a lot of the residents have actually felt the impact of the pandemic on the clinical setting which were the lockdown of the clinic sometimes, just like what we experience. There are times when during lockdown, face-to-face -face clinical interaction is not allowed. And there are the other times when it can be freely done. They experience a decrease in the number of patients per day. They decrease in the number of the staff working at the clinic and limited 
personal protective equipment. Only 9% of the total amount of residents who were surveyed said that there was no effect of the pandemic in the clinic. You wonder where these residents live and practice. But what we can see here also is that for the non-surgical residents, they were more affected by the lockdown of the clinic. They were more affected by the decrease in the number of staff working in the clinic. And they were more affected by the limited personal protective equipment. Now, what was significantly higher among surgical residents was their experience of a decreased amount of on-calls per month we are aware that there will be a delay or a decrease of most elective and non-urgent surgical and medical procedures. So that while residents in internal medicine and perhaps neurology you know, are seeing more and more patients because of the COVID, the surgical residents have experienced a significant decrease in the number of patients that they may be seeing. So the crucial restraints on residency programs that the pandemic has caused will include the closure of outpatient clinics, the delay of most elective, non-urgent surgical and medical procedures, significantly reduce clinical interaction, and all of these lead to our residents worrying about completing their residency training. Now, the pandemic has also changed the scope of residency education. We can see here in this slide the effect of the pandemic on the teaching programs. And the questionnaire asked about the effect of the pandemic on number of rounds, number of lectures, shifting to online learning, and less number of grand rounds we can see that only 5% of the total amount of residents surveyed here said that there has been no change on the teaching program at all. But most of the participants will endorse that there have been less numbers of lectures and seminars, as we can see here, followed by the shift to online learning, less grand rounds, and less number of rounds. The non-surgical residents experienced the shift to online learning and meeting significantly more than the surgical residents, which I suppose makes sense seeing that surgical residents have to learn while they are in the operating room most of the time. Now, the authors, however, identified some positive outcomes of the current crisis, which were the implementation of effective distant learning methods like online seminars, recorded or live stream lectures, such as what we are doing at the moment, and the introduction of telemedicine as an efficient method for patients and healthcare providers. They project that most of these online-based methods will continue to exist and impact healthcare beyond the current pandemic. What about the mental health impact on residents? Items regarding mental health impact in the questionnaire, which were endorsed by the residents, included anxiety about the pandemic in itself, seeing increased stress and anxiety among colleagues, depressive symptoms because of the pandemic, a fear of getting infected, a fear of potentially spreading COVID-19 to family members, and because of that, loneliness and staying away from family due to the COVID-19 risk. Now, non-surgical residents also tended to endorse more distress compared to surgical residents, perhaps also, again, because of their more active role in the management of patients with COVID-19. Now, according to Dr. Tolu, many programs have restructured their call schedules to reduce the number of in-house residents while others also face the possibility of resident redeployment to service with greater demand. So they may be redeployed to other areas, particularly residents in family medicine who can be deployed now to vaccination sites, who can be deployed to COVID areas rather than learning, say, for example, about psychiatry or neurology. 
Now, residents during their dedicated research years, and these are for residents with one year set aside for research, grapple with suspensions of research activities that threaten scientific progress. And he continues, given all these sudden changes, residents will have a significant reduction in the exposure to all the pillars of their training, I suppose, except for infectious medicine, which they now learn by heart, with no clear endpoint. This is a huge burden for residency directors and consultants, yet there are no universal or multi-institutional recommendations. Might I add that it's also a huge burden for residents in training as well. What have residents done to cope? Another study which sought to examine the coping styles of residents have found that these workplace constraints together with the mental and physical burden of the pandemic brings light the adopted fragile support systems, not just for residents, but for healthcare workers in general. But when they looked at healthcare workers and residents, the most common strategy of coping was seeking social contact and support. This was different from seeking psychological support. And in fact, there was less interest or utilization in professional mental health services. Although the residents perceived this offer to be helpful, not a lot of them actually utilized this offer. Why not? may we ask, and the authors also proposed several reasons. These were the residents had experienced high work burdens and after doing one week long duty, sometimes all they want to do is sleep and eat and watch Netflix. There is also this fear of seeking face-to-face -face consultations with psychiatrists because of their fear of having contracted COVID and spreading it to other people. They have high levels of worry, and um, this is in particular about being stigmatized, being afraid to show weakness, and difficulty in accessing support. So the authors will recommend proactive organizational approaches which are less stigmatizing and more effective. They are advocating adaptive leadership in the form of the healthcare institution in itself, rather than us as individuals reaching out to residents in need. And there is a need to scale up these institutional efforts for the residents in training, considering the alarming levels of stress and anxiety among residents specifically and healthcare workers generally, increased institutional efforts should be invested in order to avoid exacerbating the concern particularly as we see the COVID-19 pandemic to last longer than what we had initially expected. We should consider the culture that we foster in our medical institutions, since the organi organizational culture can be a catalyst in either building or breaking trust between the healthcare workforce and the administration. Now, healthcare institutions and residency programs should also be capable of demonstrating a commitment to the well being of residents. And these should be done in concrete, tangible ways, like obtaining residency, um, resident feedback about residency training programs, or maintaining constant communication, or providing psychological help. There, sorry, there can be seven areas to target when it comes to these. The first, of course, is to meet the basic needs of residents and other healthcare workers, sending food, PPEs, especially, and um, making sure that they are all right while they are on duty. Delivering coordinated planning and communication. When we ask them, for example, to do didactics or to do grand rounds, it should be planned and communicated well what is expected of them. Promoting, the third is promoting staff coping skills and the ability to support colleagues and webinars have been suggested for that. The fourth is 
the ability to identify and assist distressed residents. So some residents will not tell us that they are distressed because they are scared of the consultants, because they are worried that maybe they'll be asked to take a leave because maybe they're just shy. So there should be a procedure in which we can identify staff or residents in distress. And this has to be applied to all residency training programs, not just that of psychiatry. Promoting connectedness, despite the virtual nature of connections, it is still helpful. The provision of robust, accessible mental health services. And again, these are for residents in training among other specialties. And the last is maximizing learning. We have to remember that residents are in training because they need to learn. They are not there because we need them as pawns for the COVID-19 pandemic. And many residents feel like that. Many residents feel like I'm going to finish my training and all I know is how to intubate people with COVID-19. Let's not let that happen. In order to promote residency learning during the pandemic, we can establish several changes that will actually protect their time to learn. How can we also encourage interactive learning? Here are some tips. For example, in academic sessions, we can improve active learning with a pause procedure. Like, let's take a moment to think about the journal we're talking about and then ask questions and discuss. Flipped classrooms and weekly quizzes may also help facilitate more learning. Virtual simulation can help for people or residents who need to be trained on skills, particularly that of resuscitation, for example. On-shift learning can be done. Shifts, um, there can be actually a method so that consultants can actually make the most of question or case-based teaching opportunities and practice variations around these cases. Now, the best way to learn, of course, is to teach. And residents can be offered virtual teaching sessions for medical students. And in doing so, the residents can hone their educational skills as well as provide an important service to medical student learning. Finally, resident learning can be incorporated with wellness. Implementation of virtual events, such as ice cream or coffee rounds, yoga, virtual social evenings can be done. Virtual check-ins from program directors, consultants, and um, other healthcare staff may also be done. In summary, the COVID-19 pandemic has greatly impacted the flow of residency training programs. It has increased the personal health mental and physical risk that residents are exposed to. And this calls for collaborative efforts from healthcare institutions to adapt both educational and psychological techniques to compensate for such limitations. Initiatives to raise awareness of psychological and coping re responses, emphasis on self-care, addressing issues of stigma when it comes to consultation, about their mental health and the provision of access to resources for help can enhance psychological support for our residents in training. Now, for many of us who work in university and training hospitals, residency training responsibilities are one of the duties that we have agreed to fulfill. Let this not be limited to psychiatry residents alone. We have to be able to speak up on behalf of the other residents when it comes to their psychological needs to our respective institutions. Because while there is much that hospitals cannot control, we all need to take concerted and comprehensive action to support the mental health of our residents. I'd like to end with this slide. This slide contains to the left quotes from healthcare workers 
the names have been changed to protect their anonymity. And Richard says, there is always someone wanting something from me, and I don't know how to give it anymore. And another says, I'm getting to the point where I don't even want to go to sleep at night. I see images of the day that both frighten and upset me almost every night. And seeing the risk that the residents may have while going on duty during the COVID-19 pandemic, that's Department of Psychiatry in UERM initiated a proactive method to be able to assuage this risk. This was promoted in UERM as early as March 11, 2020. And this was done in the form of a poster saying, let's talk. We are open for phone consultations for frontliners. A psychiatrist was assigned to be on deck every day, ready to provide first aid and other interventions, not just for residents, but for all members of the UERM COVID-19 team. I hope that similarly, we can extend our support or continue to extend our support to the members of our healthcare institutions, particularly our residents in other specialties. These were the references used for the presentation tonight. I'd like to thank the UERM Department of Psychiatry for taking such good care of me when I was a resident as well, and also for being able to come up with such a wonderful program so early in the course of the pandemic. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the reaction of Dr. Chua. that very informative and interesting lecture, Dr. Mariano. I'm sure that everyone has learned a lot about the impact of this pandemic to mental health, specifically to our healthcare workers and residents in training. We thank you, ma'am, for selecting this topic. Now to represent the residents and give a reaction to Dr. Mariano's lecture, may I call on Dr. Audrey Marie Chua, a second-year neurology resident at UERF. Dr. Chua will also be sharing from her own personal experience. Thank you. Good day, everyone. Thank you for this kind introduction and thank you, Psychiatry Department, for letting me be a reactor for tonight's scientific meeting. So to start, being a doctor in training during this pandemic has been quite a challenge. From the usual going to the hospital during days without worrying being sick or going home safe to adjusting to the new norm and shifting to the new working environment. Uh, we can't help but also worry about everyone we care with the thought of how safe am I going to be when I get home by the end of my shift. How does this new norm affect my residency training? A predominant assumption in medicine is that we as doctors should be supernaturally resilient. Given the rigors of medical education, residency, and a career in medicine, our ability to navigate this journey successfully while remaining psychologically and physically resilient is an understandable source of pride. But in harboring this ideal and reinforcing it through training, do we really create a culture in which physicians easily lose sight of the fact that we are also human beings subject to illness vulnerabilities just like the patients we treat? Or do the stressors of training and their psychological consequences negatively impact our ability to be good doctors? So in my personal experience prior to COVID, during my first year residency training, I was under the training of the internal medicine department where we were at least managing 30 to 40 patients per day for 36 hours or more, or some of us go to every other day duty, or weekends are taken off from us. The burden of academic pressure to study and know about the case prior to, prior to doing rounds or referring to consultants, as well as doing last-minute reports and on-the-spot conferences, has been a great challenge. In addition to this, as a teaching hospital, the pressure to be a better example and to teach junior and senior interns regarding whereabouts of the hospital and theoretical cases has also given us additional load to mentally challenge ourselves. And lastly, to manage patient and relative satisfaction can be sometimes difficult to achieve. 
So all of this experience can be emotionally, spiritually, and physically draining. I can still remember the exhaustion my colleagues and I felt. Every day for us was a struggle. Every day we thought on how we will be able to go through the day without breaking down and quitting. In my experience, I know some of my some of my few co-residences who were unable to cope up with training eventually find themselves lost, tired, and depressed. Some go through psychiatric counseling, needing medical treatment. Some just decided to leave residency because they can't carry on with the burden of residency training. And for me, I always try to be resilient enough to go through the day, but I too sometimes can't handle the fact that I also get burned out and my mental health was at point exhausted and confused. As a doctor in training, normally we already have the risk of psychological distress and our mental health has always been a brink of losing. So in a survey that I've read suggests that psychological distress increased during the residency training itself. Um, because compared to age similar college graduates, medical students began their medical education already with burnout at a lower rate compared of that during residency training, which is 27% versus 30%, and depression around 26 versus 42%. So factors contributing to psychological distress includes academic pressure, financial burdens, mistreatment, and developing professional cynicism. So these negative impacts of psychological distress are further exacerbated during residency by long working hours, overnight shifts, deaths, dissatisfaction with lifestyle and with their job itself, as well as lack of autonomy. There is also little time for us to develop aspect of identity that is unrelated to medicine that could contribute to a sense of self-fulfillment and the quality of relationship that might provide a more secure base of social support. With all this stress can lead to a burnout, including exhaustion, depersonalization, and decreased sense of personal accomplishment, which previous studies have shown affects around at least 50 to 75 residents in training. So even before COVID-19 pandemic, it has been demonstrated um, resident trainees face burnout, depression, anxiety during their training. So resident trainees and fellow physicians are at elevated risk for developing depression compared to general population. We are also less likely to utilize mental health services. So considering the countless stressors stacked up against us, Research on the prevalence of depression in trainees produce a foreseeable outcome. Around 29% have depression or depressive symptoms, a figure that has increased slightly over the past few decades, and the prevalence of depression increased by 0.5% per calendar year. So how does this mental health situation with resident doctors compared with the mental health now with an added stressor of COVID-19? So in this pandemic, this has dramatically changed our lives as residents, as well as the consultants and medical students. In particular, the learning process has undergone wide changes, especially due to rules of social distancing, which have forced training institutions and hospitals to modify lessons, workship, workshops, and internships. Mental health issues experienced by us residents are missing from most of the studies despite being essential to the COVID-19 response and continuing to provide care at this time. So since the spread of COVID-19 worldwide, there is a study in which healthcare providers have been asked to rise to the challenge of both treating increasing numbers of patients and adapting to medical practice to protect themselves and their patients from contracting the virus. These cumulative stressors can have mental health implications to higher rates of anxiety, depression, insomnia, and distress during this pandemic. In addition to the baseline systemic stressors that put us residents at risk for mental distress, we also face COVID-19 related stressors that exacerbate the risk. Even if thorough flattening the curve and raising the line in the, is the main strategy in the control of the pandemic, Decrease in healthcare capacity due to poor mental health and frustration of healthcare providers can also cause significant problems. So another study, the potential for a decline in resident physician well-being due to COVID-19 pandemic is highly plausible. So the psychological effect of COVID-19 pandemic among healthcare personnel was demonstrated by different authors found that healthcare personnel demonstrate symptoms of increased depression, 
anxiety, and distress due to the pandemic. Similarly, reviews on psychological sequelae on he among healthcare personnel revealed a number of negative emotional outcomes, including stress, irritability, fear, and boredom associated with quarantine. So studies have described the impact of inadequate testing, limited treatment options, and insufficient personal protective equipment on the psychological health of healthcare uh, personnel has also affected us. So in the effects of COVID-19 in our mental health, the emergence in this pandemic has been a massive test for the healthcare system. In our roles as trainees and physicians, uh, we residents are participating in COVID-19. Normally, we are affected by work-related stressors, including lack of control, unpredicted caseload, stressful work situations, financial problems, as well as work-life conflicts. But during COVID-19, we face a variety of disruptive changes to work and training that exacerbate the effects of regular work-related stressors and expose us to unprecedented ones. So what we have here, number one, we have the increase of work. Many of us residents are um, experiencing increase in workload as a result of covering for peers and staff that may be off work due to being immunocompromised or those who have been exposed or are self-isolating or are ill. We also had uh, effects on canceled leaves because as residents, we normally have vacation and professional leave, but many have had this canceled because of high clinical needs. Given our status as trainees, we are recruited to be redeployed to support emergency medicine, internal medicine, and intensive care units. This is mandated and there is much uncertainty because redeployment needs are fluid. During COVID-19, when physicians could not access adequate personal protective equipment, many residents cannot be so assertive because of power imbalance and fear of retribution. There is also disruption to our training if we residents are redeployed in any capacity if we are working from home or are off of work. Some of us residents may require training extensions that would delay our personal and uh, professional goals. In cert certification and licensing, residents applying to subspecialties or fellowships are, um, are also affected, as well as the final year residents who are experiencing delay in certification exam. This is true since most of my seniors who are already finished their diplomat exams are unable to apply to the hospitals that cater to their desired subspecialties. And lastly, we have the evolving mental health needs. In general, experience in the moment may include fear of being infected or transmitting the disease to others, strains of social isolation, poor training and support, and variable access to personal protective equipment. So these necessary changes can have profound effects on our professional development, may have future implications on the preparedness of practice for our own specialties. Other effects of mental health during work in pandemic includes overwhelming work manifested by a very high volume of patients, the difficulty in using the PPEs or protective equipment, an ever-increasing number of severe cases and high mortality rates. Ambiguity is an inability to successfully treat patients and unpredictable of sudden course of the disease. We also experience losing control over situations in which we feel helpless due to ineffectiveness of routine treatments, depletion of existing human resources, and inadequacy of previous work experience. We also felt um, shortage of protective um, devices, the sense of providing futile care in which disease has no definite cure, patients still dis die despite the hard work and feeling of pointlessness. A sense of consciousness and self-sacrifice, being loyal to the medical oath and preparing ourselves to give lives for others and risking our health for others. So even with those effects of mental health during working at the hospital, um, personal life has been um, also sacrificed for most of us resident trainees. Our work personal life balance has become deranged at some point. For example, fundamental changes in the daily activity in which um, there is change in the way we live as well as um, impaired relationship with our loved ones. We were prisoners in isolation under and for separation from our families. Self-quarantine, 
due to um, the nature of the disease, its high transmiss uh, transmission rate, and the fear of being a symptomatic carrier, most of us had completely separated our lives from our family. Fear of transmitting the disease to family members, um, again, being fear of carrier and transmitting the disease to the family members or your friends, um, is the biggest concern from all of us. The fear of dying alone and separating from our loved ones is also um, a challenge in our mental health and feeling of guilt and remorse. And some of us blame ourselves if something happens to one of our family. So the stress related to being healthcare provider, providers during the pandemic combined with the loss of educational opportunities may have implication for us trainees well-being and further exacerbate, exacerbate feelings of burnout. So resident Burnout is higher than burnout seen among similarly aged medical students, physicians, or college graduates, and the rate of physician burnout is nearly around 50%. Therefore, addressing mental wellness concerns during residency training is crucial. While we are um, many known contributing factors to resident mental wellness include safety vibration, lack of autonomy, and environmental and workplace stressors, the current pandemic adds to the novel burden. So in summary, those mentioned, um, I have here this model consists of three levels, including early exposure, um, crisis peak, and long-term effect. So here, the first two themes, that is including working in the pandemic era and the changes in personal life and enhanced negative effect contributed to the mental health and needs of healthcare providers during COVID-19. So, what is the status of COVID-19 now? As of August 1, 2021, the World Health Organization has documented the worldwide with the number of cases estimating to almost 200 million with 4.2 million deaths around the globe. So by region, the Southeast Asia has contributed to 38 million with the highest number at the United States. And in the Philippines, we have an estimated 1.6 million cases with around 28,000 deaths in this pan since the pandemic began. So again, with the surge of a new variant, the Delta variant of COVID-19, which is more contagious than the other SARS-CoV-2 virus strains, has reached our country, making us again under enhanced community quarantine. Research has, has shown that the Delta variant spreads more easily between people and appears that people are transmitting the virus to others sooner than people spread the original strain of the coronavirus. The combination of higher viral load and the ability to spread the virus to others earlier and the fact that this variant spreads more efficiently makes the Delta variant more worrisome. It is shown that unvaccinated people who are infected with COVID-19 Delta variant are twice as likely to be hospitalized due to the severity of the illness than people who are infected with COVID-19 Alpha variant, which had previously been identified as a more contagious than the original strain of the virus. So when will this end? I really can't say. There are no studies yet when, is the, um, when will this coronavirus end. So when we thought that um, it's going to end soon after the production and provision of vaccine, a newer vi variant of the COVID-19 emergence emerges that is more contagious and spreads fast, leading to us to question how and when will this ever end. So again, how does this affect us in the medical practice? As resident trainings, as well as the other healthcare workers, um, our morale becomes low. So with some doctors, or some resident trainees are working at least 36 hour shifts again in order to cover for colleagues who are either sick or self-isolating. Some doctors or healthcare workers are fed up with the lack of proper pay and working conditions in the country. So with the upcoming ECQ, this has become a cycle of anxiety, depression, stress, and burnout with added burden from the new variant of COVID-19, which again overwhelms the healthcare system. As long as the population has not been fully vaccinated, we are still at the risk of contracting the virus. We are only safe when everyone is safe. So how, um, how do we cope up with COVID-19? It is natural to feel stress, anxiety, grief, and worry during COVID-19 pandemic. And learning to cope with stress in a healthy way will make you, the people you care about, and those around you become more resilient in this time of COVID. 
Number one, we should take breaks from watching, reading, or listening to news stories about COVID-19, including those in social media. It's good to be informed, but hearing about the pandemic constantly can be upsetting. Number two, take care of your body. Take deep breaths, stretch, and meditate. Try to eat healthy with well-balanced meals and exercise regularly. Get plenty of sleep as well. Make time to unwind. Try to do some other activities you enjoy. Connect with others. Talk with people you trust about your concern and how you are feeling. Connect with the community or faith-based organization. And how do I cope up with COVID and residency? As most of us now that residency training, uh, as most of us now that residency training is here and we're in COVID-19, uh, I always take time to rest and sleep and recharge. I watch movies and I too do exercise. I restart my hobby. I like cooking before and ever since the pandemic, I started to divert my attention to cooking, which gave me a sense of calming and diverting my attention. Support system. I seek comfort from my family and friends, but due to COVID-19, it has given us limitation to go home and see our beloved ones. But the advantage of having this pandemic in this era is that advancing technology. Through internet, platforms such as FaceTime, Zoom, or Google Meet, it has given me a chance to have an easy access to see how and what's going on with my family and friends. Since the start of COVID-19, skeletal, skeletal duty was implemented, and since there are limited in-person teaching, I take time to learn on my own and adjust and read on cases. Um, get tested for COVID. It gave me the sense of protection and security that I could always go home safe to my family and give my family assurance that um, I, their daughter who works at a hospital, is also safe. Get vaccinated. This will give us hope that anytime soon we will be back to normal and we can be together with our loved ones. And lastly, remain calm and pray. It has been the most helpful tool in giving strength to, to go on with life in general, especially at the time of training and seeing those who are in need of you. And lastly, gaining experience, normalization, and adaptation to the pandemic. In the end, all of this experience we had will eventually become growth and development over time. This showed as a result of overcoming the initial crisis, gaining experience with regard to patient management, reducing referrals, and increase in recovery. Under these circumstances, the pandemic situation had become normal life for us. However, this adaptation to the pandemic is still accompanied by worries and about the future and eventual pandemic fatigue. So in gaining experience, most of us believe that we had gained more experience in managing patients over time that would help us treat patients in the future. Adaptation to the pandemic, adaptation includes learning um, protective techniques, coping and isolation and social distancing and reducing our fear of the illness. And lastly, normalization of life. After the early stages, Living and working in new conditions and adoption of new routines had become almost normal for us. Learning to live with the disease and use of protective measure as a new way of life. So uh, this is uh, the end of my reaction. Here are my references and thank you so much. So I have here um, uh, a quote from Jericho Silvers, uh, which is, um, very much uh, likely attributed to our current condition. Thank you. That was an equally informative and sincere response for tonight's lecture, Dr. Chua. Thank you. I'm sure that all of us have a lot in our minds after listening to our speaker and reactor. So to justify our curiosity, we will have an open forum to be facilitated by one of our first year residents, Dr. Vina Jona Almadi. So at this point, may we invite everyone to type in their questions in the chat box. Thank you. Hello, good evening um, to everyone. Dr. Mariano, congratulations for that wonderful lecture and Dr. Chua for that great reaction. So to kick off our open forum, we have our first question for Dr. Mariani. Um, so from uh, 
Mamlis, uh, the question is, do you believe that the initial program implemented by the department that you shared with us um, is still applicable now, given the chronicity of the situation and the emergence of the new Delta variant? I apologize, Rina. I missed a part of your question. Um, the question is the initial program implemented by the department, the Let's Talk um, program. Do you think it's still applicable um, now, given the chronicity of the situation? Sorry about that. So thank you for the question. I really believe that this program, the Let's Talk program, which was a uh, a sort of psychological helping hand to all the staff in need in the UERM community, particularly during the initial phases of the pandemic was indeed very helpful. And currently, although not as much as before, we are still seeing some queries coming from our residents in training from other specialties. Sometimes it takes a really good training officer to recognize when a resident in training in another specialty might be in need of psychological assistance or even psychiatric, um, consult psychiatric consultations, including medications. And so this program will remain open, I believe, for as long as the residents and the healthcare staff will be needing it. That will cover all phases of the pandemic, even as hopefully we survive the, uh, the Delta variant, even as we struggle through the Delta variant, even as we try to rehabilitate and rebuild again and recover, there will be challenges for our healthcare staff, which we can, as psychiatrists of the department, help to address. Despite that, we understand that to be leaders of change, we cannot focus on the individual alone. We can't focus just on the micro level. We have to address the meso and the macro levels. And that will entail departmental, um, usually um, departmental changes for residents in training in other specialties, camustahan sessions, which are, I think, frequent in the field of psychiatry, but perhaps not so in other specialties. In a more uh, bigger level, we have to call for the promotion of institutional changes. Now is not the time to conform to the rigid hierarchical leadership structures of traditional healthcare and universities. I think now it has to be a time where healthcare leaders can go down to the front lines and talk to residents and ask them how they are and what they need and how can the entire institution support them. So the short answer, of course, is, well, yes, I do think that it still serves a purpose. This is the tip of the iceberg. If we did what we could do well to support these residents, then we won't even need to have, you know, um, to, to exert as much effort to be able to help them cope because they would not need to be in such difficult places to begin with. Great question, Nina. Thank you.